I wanted to note something for you here in the preface, which we've been looking at this week. So you note that in the very beginning of the preface to the new edition, Ratzinger says that there's a Marxist doctrine of salvation, right? A soteriology. That's the term for a doctrine of salvation in Christianity. All right? And uh, so he goes on into a dialogue about how Marxism has promised, or promised to a previous generation at least, perhaps even now, a kind of freedom and redemption for humanity through praxis, through the primacy, as he says, of politics and economics, combining together the, uh, politic the idea of the political animal that we are, from Aristotle, with the need to calculate economically cost and benefit, right? Hence the use of terms um, associated with proportionalism, the calculus of consequences, right? Can we calculate the consequences of actions? Can we even give a cost-benefit analysis to certain of our actions, as we do in healthcare right now? Some of you are, become, are trained to become medical professionals. This is a, something you will face directly and immediately. How much is this life worth in this procedure? And uh, what are we to do about this idea of a cost of a procedure with respect to this, um, what they need, okay? And whether or not it's permissible to engage in this, this procedure and activity. Okay. So if we take a cost-benefit analysis and combine that with action, something that needs to happen, we focus on what we can create and make uh, to be. Right? This is, in fact, why Marxism promises um, and has a kind of doctrine of salvation. It is saying we will set you free by these kinds of activities and actions. Political action combined with the cost-benefit analyses, perhaps, that go with economics. Okay. And in this context, I was struck today, going over this again for you, by the way that he says that uh, in liberation theology, for example, which he does not poo-poo, he does not dismiss, he just says, look, there can be problems if it sanctions violence unnecessarily, for example, um, or short-circuits discussions about just war, just uses of force. And uh, he then goes into a discussion about, well, the problem is that it looks as though God has nothing to do, he says this on page 16. We must take action. We must take up arms, perhaps, for God has nothing to do, so it seems. Right? God is not a player in the game. There is no, if there is a God, well, you know, fine. But God isn't the one who's going to be able to set us free right now. We must take action. Right? And so he seems to be taking exception with, with this. Right? Um, God has nothing to do. Is he engaged? Is God there? Right? Does God judge? Does God suffer? Does God set limits and standards for us? Who is this God about whom we're speaking? Right? Uh, he says, well, we seem to have relegated God in the contemporary context where faith in Christianity has been lessened and perhaps even entirely lost because we don't believe in grand moral promises, as you noted in my opening notes for the text, and he does as well, right? Uh, that we don't trust these promises, that in fact faith in God can bring about a new future, for example, that we would all find utopian in some way good. It would rather be a dystopia, something we don't want to occur. Um, so this God is a God, it seems now, who has nothing to do. Right? Um, the God who judges and suffers, the God who sets limits and standards for us, the God from whom we come and to whom we are going, uh, really is relegated to a ghetto, right? Uh, and now he has nothing to do. Okay? And this is a major concern of his. What does this mean, God has nothing to do? He, he gets into this later after he goes through his discussion about the God is dead discussion, um, after Nietzsche in, in the 19th century, and comes full circle at the end of his preface to the way that we need to understand that God has come close. This is the Christian message he thinks in a very, in a nugget form, right, in a seed form, in Nietzsche, okay, that uh, we need to see and understand that in fact, Though we may have the impression that God has nothing to do, God has acted and has come close. It is not distant. Hence the accent of 28 to 29. Right? He says we have these Western fears which we need to face. Right? And what we, are, what we see is that God is in fact not so remote as we would like to make him out to be, which is common to perhaps what we would call a deistic view. God may have created the universe, but he's turned his back on it since then. Jefferson, for example, held that kind of view. He says at the bottom of 28, a notion of God's remoteness from the world is behind our apparently humble realism, and therefore a loss of God's presence is also connected with it. 
If God is not in Christ, then he retreats into an immeasurable distance. And if God is no longer a God with us, then he is plainly an absent God, and thus no God at all. A God who cannot work is not God. As for the fear that Jesus moves us too far away if we believe in his divine sonship, precisely the opposite is true. If he was only a man, then he has retreated irrevocably into the past, and then only a distant recollection can perceive him more or less clearly. But if God has truly assumed manhood, and thus is at the same time true man and true God in Jesus, then he participates as man in the presence of God, which embraces all ages. Then and only then is he not just something that happened yesterday, but is present among us, our contemporary in our today. That is why I am firmly, firmly convinced that a renewal of Christology must have the courage to see Christ in all of his greatness, as he is presented by the four Gospels together in the many tensions of their unity. He later calls this, I would, I would develop what I had done many years ago with a narrative Christology, and uh, he's using that term again, Christology. This, is, this has to do with the study of Christ as the Messiah, what this means. And get into nitty-gritty details in Christianity about how we define Jesus, how we talk about Jesus. All this discussion of Jesus falls into the category of Christology, okay? a specialized term having to do with Christ. Again, meaning Messiah, anointed one. Okay? But he's saying, really, that the rich teaching for Christians on who Jesus is helps us understand how God has come close to us. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And he is not retreated into an immeasurable distance, but is rather with us. And so, we can't say God has nothing to do right, in the Christian account. God has done his utmost, if you will, to come after us. Right? He's gone, as Karl Barth said, into the far country after us, in pursuit of us. He is, to use Francis Thompson's term, this poet, the great English poet, the hound of heaven. He comes hounding after us. Right? He doesn't simply let us be. Uh, and... Of course, for us, who, those of us who are distant from the events of Christ in the first century, find this difficult to swallow and difficult to understand. And in his other writings, Benedict Ratzinger seems to indicate that a place where we hear this is uh, we hear the voice of God in our conscience. Right? And so, if we are to assess how we are to be free as persons, um, our pursuit of knowledge, goodness, and truth lead us to a formation of conscience through which we can recognize who and what we ought to be. But we need the capacity to listen to that without coercion, violence, and um, manipulation. Okay. So we may be distant from that event, but as we will later see in the text and in the context of this course, Christians believe that Christ is ever-present to us in the Church and through the Spirit. Okay. So I wanted to note this idea that God seems to be a God who has nothing to do, and this challenges me. Uh, I feel this very much, um, very strongly in my own life, in my own struggle as a person, that uh, it does seem that God has nothing to do, and it's a rich thing to wrestle with, I think, from what Benedict is saying here, Ratzinger is saying. Do we assume God has nothing to do? What does that say about our concept of God? Because recall here that at the, in this preface he's saying there are two things about which I'm not swearing at you here. Two things about which uh, this text is concerned. The figure of Jesus Christ and the concept of God. Okay, and these come together for Christianity. So wrestling theologically, that is, with who God is, the theos, right, uh, is what this course is about. And um, when we analyze our assumptions about who God is, it becomes quite interesting for us to think that we may have some buried assumptions, such as God has nothing to do. What do I mean by that? What could that possibly mean? in our contemporary context. And I think he does a good job of pointing us in directions that are fruitful and uh, good dinner conversations, conversations around the keg and so forth, um, in moderation, of course. Um, so anyway, the best philosophy and theology often happens in the pub or in conversation with these friends of ours, okay, with whom we can have these discussions about what we think about God. So note that uh, Christology this teaching about who Jesus is in the Christian tradition uh, is central to our definition of God. All that we say about God is filtered through and goes through that focal point of who Jesus is. Okay? And it should challenge us, challenge us uh, in our consideration of God. Does he have nothing to do or is he there with us in the thick of it? And if so, how?
so thank you. <laughs>